The truth is there's more to urea than meets the eye and this little molecule is jam-packed full of surprises and even physiological functions. Hello Dr. Humans, welcome back to the channel and today's video where we will be giving some serious love to urea. Now, of course, as a nephrologist, I'm not usually giving love to urea. I'm usually dialyzing it off. But the truth is, there's more to urea than meets the eye. And this little molecule is jam-packed full of surprises and even physiological functions. And chances are, you've already danced with urea in various clinical scenarios. We've all seen how urea becomes disproportionately elevated during upper GI bleeds or with dehydration. And you may also have noticed the rise in urea with glucocorticoids or in severe heart failure. And today we're going to deepen our understanding of how urea becomes elevated in these situations. But in order to do this, we must first understand the normal physiology of urea. And of course, this involves my favorite part of the body, the nephron. I am so excited. I hope you are too. Let's jump right in. So urea is a nitrogenous waste product. We eat protein in our diet, the liver processes this protein, and we generate urea. Now, urea is not the only nitrogenous waste product created here, but it's the one we measure. So in that sense, urea is a surrogate marker for all of the different nitrogenous waste products that we have in our circulation. And it's these nitrogenous waste products that result in the uremic symptoms and complications of end-stage renal failure. And that is so different from creatinine. If I injected you with a big syringe of creatinine, nothing would happen. Not a thing. It's not a harmful molecule. But if I injected you with a big syringe of nitrogenous waste products, that's a lot more noxious. So urea is a nitrogenous waste product made in the liver. And in health, we get rid of urea via the kidney. So now let's see how urea travels through the nephron. Urea is freely filtered into the proximal tubule. From there, we lose 30 to 50% in our urine. So we're losing a fair bit of urea, but equally, we're holding on to 50 to 70% of this molecule every time it goes through the nephron. So why on earth would we do that? And now we arrive at the concept of urea as not just a waste product, but as a molecule with some physiological purpose. And the physiological role of urea is in aiding water reabsorption. Urea is an osmotically active molecule, meaning that it can draw water towards it. And if we place lots of urea into the interstitium around the collecting ducts, this creates an incredible concentration gradient for water reabsorption. Insert an aquapore in here and water will move eagerly towards this urea. So that's the end game, putting urea into the interstitium to promote water reabsorption. But there's also some magic to this. Here in the loop of Henle and collecting duct, the urea will move passively into the interstitium along its concentration gradient. But when we're dehydrated, the proximal tubule helps things along by creating an even higher concentration gradient. This is fascinating. Let me show you. Okay, so the proximal tubule is our mass reabsorption, mass recycling center. Everything in our plasma except blood cells and big proteins will enter the proximal tubule. And the proximal tubule will go about reabsorbing all of those useful things, including salt and water. As sodium moves across, water will follow, but then urea gets left behind. Urea becomes lonely and also more concentrated than it was before. <laughs> And so, with this newfound concentration gradient, urea will become reabsorbed into the bloodstream. Now, at first, that might seem a little bit backwards, but check this out. When this blood comes back into the proximal tubule, urea levels are now higher than they were before. And again, some of that urea will be reabsorbed here in the proximal tubule, but some of it will stay behind in the tubular lumen. And when it reaches the loop of Henle and collecting duct, this creates a higher concentration of urea to move passively into the interstitium. And from there, it can promote lots of water reabsorption. How cool is that? The nephron truly is a magical place. And so, now it makes sense. The general medical patient with the plasma urea, that's slightly higher than you would expect for the creatinine, 
is happening due to dehydration. Because in dehydrated states, we reabsorb more salt and water, and by default, we reabsorb more urea. And by having more urea in the blood, they are able to boost the concentration gradient the next time that urea enters the nephron. But that's not all. There's more. Because what I've described so far is just the passive movement of urea along the concentration gradient. But we also have urea transporters, which work to pump urea into the interstitium from the peritubular capillaries. And these urea transporters are under the influence of hormones such as vasopressin. The plot thickens. So, when we are dehydrated, vasopressin is released from our pituitary gland and it works to promote the transport of urea into the interstitium to create a beautiful concentration gradient for water reabsorption. And as we know, vasopressin also promotes the insertion of aquaporins into the collecting duct so that we can take advantage of this wonderful concentration gradient that has been created. It is a thing of beauty. Okay, so just to swing back and make sure that we understand the clinical scenarios in which urea levels are disproportionate to creatinine. So we have dehydration, GI bleeds, heart failure, and corticosteroid juice. We just unpacked the dehydrated GenMed patient, so we're all across that mechanism. With severe heart failure, the issue is with reduced cardiac output, which makes the kidney think that it's dehydrated. The kidney receives less blood supply than it deems to be normal, and so the mechanisms for salt and water retention are ramped up, and as a consequence, we get increased urea in our blood as well. So in heart failure, it's more that the kidney perceives a low blood supply. It thinks it's dehydrated, even when that person is floridly overloaded. And so the heart failure patient is going to be reabsorbing salt, water, and urea. Now, upper GI bleeds can lead to disproportionate urea elevation because when the blood enters the small intestine, it's digested into protein, and that protein is transported to the liver where it is processed and urea is generated. And lastly, glucocorticoid use. This is about urea production. Corticosteroids impact protein metabolism and result in increased urea synthesis in the liver. So sometimes when someone's on very high dose steroids, you'll see that their urea will increase disproportionately to their creatinine. Too easy. So that was all of the clinical scenarios that lead to disproportionately elevated urea as compared to creatinine. So good for exams and also so good for quizzing your medical students on your next ward round. I hope you enjoyed this lesson and it helped your studies. And if you are studying for your exams and you haven't already, be sure to check out our free GN tutorial over on our website. It's like a cheat code for learning GN and I want you to have it. So go ahead, click that link, grab your freebie and I will see you again soon for some more high yield learning. Bye.